I know this chapter has been getting a little long, but this is another important concept. Functionally, it's kind of combining the stuff we've seen already, and it really is just extending Faraday's law, which is that, and then saying that, oh hey, this EMF here is just delta v, so that must be this other integral here. So then we end up getting an integral on both sides. It's all stuff we've known. So writing it full out, it looks a, a little intimidating, but that's the more, I guess, full form of the Faraday's law, which is, since they're both negative, we can cross out the negative. So we have the integral of the electric field, loop integral, um, around a loop. It's equal to n times d dt of the magnetic flux through the loop. So the important thing that this is telling us is, if we change my magnetic field, then we're going to induce not necessarily just voltage, but we're also inducing electric field. And that'll be a key part in completing Maxwell's equation. Also, just for parallelism's sake, this side here looks very similar to Ampere's law. It's also the B around a loop but then it's dependent on the current that's through it. Somehow we're able to make these magnetic fields that goes in a circle with the current. And on the other hand, we can make these kind of circular electric field based on a changing magnetic field. You may say the symmetry isn't perfect and there might be something missing, and you might be right, but we'll take up that later on when we deal with Maxwell's equation. And anyhow, we have one piece of the puzzle here, which is as we change the magnetic field, we're going to make some electric field possibly in a coil and even just possibly in free space. So to do that, we can look at this situation here. We have a, we want to find the induced electric field in a 50 turn coil. So you have a coil of some sort. Let's say that's 50 times. It was a certain diameter, so you can figure out the area, et cetera, et cetera. It's in, so it's in a spatial uniform field. Let's just say, you know, the field comes out of the page, that's your B, that's your before picture, and then that's your after picture. So after picture goes to less B, in fact, it goes all the way to zero. And as a result, you can use Lenz's law, etc. So the B induced must be like coming out of the page, you make up for the lost, and so your current goes like that, and if the current is going like that, that means my electric field, because currents always flow from high potential to low potential, the electric field also point in the same direction, so that a given charge, a given positive charge, will want to travel along in that direction, because you lose potential as you go around the circuit. So that's where the negative sign went away because they both have a negative sign. Which means your electric field kind of goes in the circle like that. You make these circular looking electric field by changing your magnetic field. Conceptually, that's all very important. Functionally, doing the question is not that much different from a Faraday's law question. The only real difference is you have to take that one extra step to do this last bit. But of course, again, we have this electrical symmetry. So we know that at all points on the loop that E is parallel to DL because we're going to integrate in that direction. And also E must be uniform for the same radius given the cylindrical symmetry. This you've seen before in a very similar case with magnetic field using Ampere's law. So this allows us to say that, okay, this E dot DL thing is simply E DL magnitude because they're in parallel. And then because the E is always the same in terms of magnitude, it comes out of the integral. So you know that this is E times two pi R. On the other end, this is the Faraday's law bit. We again have N. Notice we don't have that negative sign anymore. Not that we care, just caring about amplitude right now, D D T. And here again, the area is not changing. We know that for all points, 
in the area that's enclosed by the loop, every single little bit of dA that we have here, that my b is parallel to my normal vector and that I've been told my b is spatially uniform. Spatially uniform. So b same. So therefore, inside that flux calculation, these things reduce it straight down to just b itself, and then that can pop out. So we again have db dt, where this whole thing is a being constant, just becomes like that. There's a little more involved because we both have this circular loop thing going on that we've seen in Ampere's law, and we have this flux thing going on that we've dealt with in Faraday's law, but together. A here, of course, is pi r square. So the pi goes away, one of the r goes away, and we're solving for e. db dt, we're told that the change is uniform, so we can make this delta b over delta t. It goes from some non-zero thing to some zero thing, so final minus original. It's some negative number, but again, just caring about the magnitude right now. We have 50 divided by 2, multiply by my radius, not my diameter. So make sure it's half of the 15 centimeters. We are, our delta b is this negative thing, but we're going to forget about that negative sign. And if we put everything through, we have just a little bit above 9 newtons per coulomb, which isn't very big at all. We, we're quite used to dealing with things in the millions of newtons per coulomb, but that's just one way we can generate these kind of circular looking electric field. I would encourage you to go through this just a little more by yourself, again, because there is the two sides, although we're, we've been getting a lot of practice doing that so far. But the main takeaway, if you take only one thing away from this video, is to remember a very qualitative concept of, given Faraday's law is telling us that if we change my magnetic field, we're going to create some electric field.